go. Okay, Jared Schoenlein, it's my pleasure to present you a certificate with the uh, Legacy Membership. Good for, good forever. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate it. Thank you, Eric. And thank you, CCGS. Yes. And thank you. We'll we shake. appreciate all the hard work you've been yes. doing. So. Thank you. Diane. Go. I'm going to let her get right here. And it's also my pleasure to give you a certificate for a legacy membership. Good forever. Hope you'll be able to use it. And thank you so much for all the work you've been doing. Thank you very much. It's been my pleasure as well. Good. Thank you, Ken. And there's Jane. Oh, in addition, you get to fill out a form. Yeah. Oh, Jared, you get to fill out a form, form also. Like. So that you get into the membership database appropriately. Perfect. Fun. If only there was an online version of this form. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yes, we're working on it. Yeah. And she's doing she's doing a lot of work on it. Yes. So uh, are you going to do any I'm trail breakers. Trail breakers stuff on yes. the yes. camera? Yes, yes. Okay. So then we have Marsha and Jane who will do stuff on the trail breakers. And I'm going to sit down. Okay. You want me to go first? Yes. Okay. I am the current trail breakers editor and I am uh, working on issue 47. Um, and I just wanted to tell you about the importance of trail breakers. And I, I think it's uh, sometimes uh, the depth of what is in trail breakers. Not only are we featuring our, our pioneer history of Clark County, we are kind of also making current history that 20 years from now, somebody will go into trail breakers and say, oh, those were the good old days. Um, this is the last fully published Trail Breakers. It was sort of my uh, uh, working with Jane and being sort of the co-editors, uh, and it's up on the shelf. All members have the Trail Breakers as part of their benefits. And um, if you want to come in and read it in the library, of course you can, but you usually get it uh, in a digital version emailed to you as soon as it's done. The uh, past Trail Breakers are available through our website. We also have an, uh, an index for most of our Trail Breakers uh, available here in the library. But I just want to say this issue, which is uh, from July 2020 through June of 2021, um, we have a beginning of our tribute to our founders, because next year will be our 50th anniversary as a society. And uh, B. Ritter, our dear B. Ritter historian, has done our first five founding members. They are featured in this next issue. We have um, the uh, what's happening here in Vancouver day, and uh, we have a little feature about when the uh, monument to U.S. Grant was installed in Vancouver in 1927. We have members who have researched other pioneers who have uh, uh, contributed. Uh, Nancy Bethan has done an article about the first territorial governor, Isaac Stevens. And then we have members who uh, write and contribute about things that they learned about their own family on, on travels. And uh, Jane de Grand Jamp uh, had an amazing discovery down in California of one of her ancestors. She walked into a museum and it was a picture of her great grandmother prominently displayed in the entryway of the museum. So uh, the issue 47 will be out shortly. And um, it's been fun. It's a learning thing. 
And Jane, who has been our longest tenured editor, I believe, has more to tell you about the history of it. Yes. And I'm going to sit down because this is a little bit longer presentation. I want to give you a little bit of the history. They didn't start doing any publications until the society was two years old, which is why the society is off as far as newsletter uh, and the um, trailbreaker are concerned. And the newsletter and the trailbreaker for the first issue were combined. It was all of 10 pages. So this was the first issue. By the second issue, they'd gotten a little bit more organized. They had a picture of the fort, and they had the beginning of dusty pages, which were cemeteries. They had maps. They had other things like that. They had links to the past, which were pedigree charts that the members submitted. Volume 2, John Finley, Mrs. John Finley, had taken over as acting editor. And they started putting in the Vancouver Register. But they had to go down to the library, to the, the museum. They had to find the paper. They had to copy it by hand. They had to go home. They had to type it up. It was very old-fashioned way of doing things. But they had also started the census records. There was no table of contents, and it was a quarterly. And they were consecutively numbered from pages one to whatever the end of the page was in volume, uh, in issue number four. So Mrs. Uh, Joan Solem, Solheim was the editor for this one, number two. And they had started doing exchanges with other libraries, which meant that if you exchanged one of your periodicals, we'll exchange with you. And so our library was growing. She was still for volume three, I'm sorry. And the Cedar Creek Grist Mill was on the cover for the year. There was a lot more in this issue than the issues before. Volume four was the Grant House on the cover. And Joan was, again, the editor for the year. The Slocum House was on issue number five. And this was Joan's last year as editor. And she included a map of Clark County in there. Volume six was Maxine Inman and the old train depot was drawn by someone called Andy. I don't know who that was. I wasn't a member then. But it was a larger issue because more people had gotten involved. The Province Academy was on volume number seven. And Maxine was still the editor. They started putting in the financial reports for the society. So it's sort of interesting to go back and see what the costs were back then. The whole budget was $5,000. And they have the trailbreaker expenses as being probably about 800 of that, which seems like a lot 
than it was a lot back then. It was a major expense. They also did things as a souvenir program of the uh, Orchards Park and a historical sketch of that. And they started going ahead and putting in the Clark County history people. So we have John Joy and Reverend Absom Joy and some of the other people of that period. Volume 8, Janet Strode took over. She designed or had designed the cover with a pioneer with a covered wagon. And this would be the cover for the next three years. And up until this time, the Trailbreaker editor also did the newsletter. I can't imagine having both jobs. Delmar Harris did a job on photography, and you can see he had to hand draw his little picture of what he was demonstrating. In volume nine, there was the beginning of early Clark County schools. And so this is an interesting article. Volume 10 was by Barbie Baker, not Barbara Baker, our treasurer today, but Mrs. John Baker. And with this issue was the beginning of the Vancouver papers. And I was able to find, this is marked in blue here, one of Larry's relatives had been mentioned as his wife had died and the pastor of St. Luke's Parish attended the funeral and that's it, it's written up in the diary of St. Luke's, which is a book for sale here. Volume 11, you'll recognize this cover because this is a cover that we have even today. I don't know whether this was commissioned, but um, the author of this cover, the artist, was a D. Crenshaw Crow. Peggy Roberts started with that issue as being editor, and she was issue for three years, she was uh, the editor. Every now and then, and you'll see mistakes every now and then, it says, what do you do when you're missing a page from the previous issue? You send it out with a note and an apology the next time. So that's what they did. They, for some reason, just didn't count the page in. They missed it. In volume 12, Peggy started early Clark County people. So you have histories way back when being written. And Peggy continued on. And here's an article on the Reverend John C. Caples. He was out in the Brush Prairie area. For volume 15, Mildred Porter became editor. She was actually the editor for volume 14 as well. Mildred, thank goodness, stopped using the Roman numerals and just went to the Arab numerals, which are a lot easier for us people to understand. They started doing volunteer spots Lights. So we have history of current members in there as well. Mm -hmm. 
Volume 16, this was when I was first president the first time. And since I was president, I didn't think it was right that I should be editor. But I wasn't really editor because I had a whole lot of help. Otherwise, this would not be in existence today. And we did continued on with the history of local people. And we started doing reprints from the paper. These there were some articles that were area of Clark County that are really interesting and it's fun to go back and read them even today. We were using a paste-up system. And you can see here, it's pasted up. And there were a lot of times when we would have a rub-on alphabet and we would just line it up and rub the letter right on. They had such things back then for us to use. And we would do all the even pages and all the odd pages. Yes, Marcia? Were you printing on both sides, the final? Yes, we would print all the even sides and let them dry. And then we'd go through and print all the odd sides and let them dry. So here's number 17, my first official year as editor. And that's about the time that we started Life Members. So Life Members got put on the back. We were still using the paste-up system, but we had a lot more photos. Like this was a rub-on decoration that we used for the books. This was a flyer that came through the mail that we just copied and put into the trail breakers. There's an article here about land records and it still holds true today. So if you're a little bit confused about land records, want to know why the numbering system is so weird for sections, this is a good explanation. So there's still a lot of good articles that we still are of use today. In volume 17, there is one on how to do a pedigree chart, and how to do the chart numbers. You may not need that today in your own personal life unless you're doing research and you're wondering why is that person number 57? And usually, because it's an odd number, it's a male. But I was doing some research, and the woman had her upside down, so all the women were odd numbers. So it doesn't always follow. In 18, we had Rosemary submit a story. They were half tones. We had to take them down to timers, which is no longer there, and tell them what type of half tone we wanted. And they would do a screening process that would put little white dots in so that when they would print it at the printing press, the ink would not smear. And I think this is probably the first year that we had pictures of our president. Volume 19, I was still the editor. And the first issue went out as issue number two, not number one. So, and that's not the only error I made that was major like that. I put in the whole wrong year over the banner one year. But I then I felt really, really vindicated because the reflector did that about three months later. They put on a wrong flyer. So we're starting to use more and more half tones. And again, the officers appear.
This is volume 20, celebrating 20 years of the Trail Breakers. It has a very interesting article in here by Bob Gordon. Did William Kidd best search for smugglers? So if you're interested in smugglers, this is where you can find more information. And again, the officers were shown. Volume 24, I was still editor. I was also president. And that was the year I had a stroke. I didn't lose my mobility to walk. I didn't, people look at me and wouldn't recognize I had a stroke. Couldn't argue with my husband. Couldn't also read above a third grade level. Not good qualities for a trail breaker editor. Not good qualities for president. So John Dodge took over as president and Peggy Winston came to the rescue and took over the trail breakers for a few more years. So here's volume 24 and Peggy had this issue and oh I, I did this article before the stroke but this is another one on taking photographs and um, Lori Oakel helped me with that I went out to her house and we did that okay have some of these out of order so this is 21 where I did the wrong the wrong issue on the page and we started doing oh this one I did an article on why Clark County had an E and didn't have an E and it's in this issue this one had a good article on the printing press and the people who work there This is volume 23, and again, the officers. This was an interesting one because there's an article in here by Jean Cushman. And she says it was written at the break of the year 2000 2001 time period i have heard that many computers are going to have serious problems with dates in the year 2000 as the turn of the century i have even heard and read this is the last presidential election of the century not so unless we're not having a presidential election in 1000 in spite of what you hear or read the year 2000 is not the beginning of the next century but it's the last year of this century. And we all use that incorrectly. The first century comprised of the year I, one through 100. The second century combined the year 101 through 200. The 19th century combined the years 1801 through 9,000. I mean, sorry, 19,000. The 20th century will comprise of the years 1901 through 2000. In the past summer, the Los Angeles Olympics were much ballyhooed as the last Summer Olympics of this millennium, and the Sydney Olympics in 2000 were much heralded as the new of the first millennium. But wait, the first millennium comprises the years 1 through 1000. The second millennium will comprise the years 1001 through 2000. The third millennium begins January 1st, 2001, and it is the Summer Olympics in Sydney that will be the last of this millennium. Time flies fast enough without being hurried along through it. But I thought that was interesting because we so often misuse that.
This was the uh, volume 24 where I mislabeled, and this is number 25. And 25 had the Burt family from Battleground. This was when things were being done for the Pioneer books, and I think Rosemary might have written, no, this was written by um, Larry Hinderley, probably for the Red Book. In 1999, we had a sugar plum fairy tea, and it's put on the last page of the Trail Breakers. In volume 27 in the fall, Peggy Winston was the editor. Peggy was editor two times under two names because she was first a Roberts and then a Winston. This is volume 28. And there were some reprints of the Oregonian, sorry, it's the Oregon Journal by um, Fred Lockley. He wrote several books as well. And here's our Celebrating 40 Years. It was issue volume 40, of course. And because it was the Trail Breakers, we had another nice article showing the print shop. By this time, we were probably doing everything on computer. We used to be putting our draft of what was going on, and this is mine, it has very little. Compare this to Peggy Winston, who typed hers out very neatly and nicely. But it gave us a plan of where we were going and what we needed. And we would borrow from the newspapers. They were talking about vandalism in the cemeteries. In the year 2000, Peggy thought it would be nice to have a new cover, but we never did see this cover. And I thought you would be interested in seeing that she had one planned even though it wasn't used. It's a very modernistic one, showing a family walking into the future, showing items from the past and the future. And I think that ends my summary of what the Trailbreaker has done in the last few years. Ready? Yes. What I get out of this is that the Trailbreaker gives us the stories, the history of pioneers of not necessarily just Clark County, and sort of fills in the flesh of history, makes it more interesting. Yes. To people than just it's a place where you can have submitted stories for the trail breaker yes. about your family, yes. but it's giving example to others what they can do on their own also, because everyone has a story. Yes. It's just for those that need to just sit down and write it. And That's I'm, what you want as an editor. As Editor Marsha would desire all of those. Those stories. Yes. Every one of you is a potential writer, and I know it. <laughs> yes. Any other questions? Okay, Eric. Well, thank you, Jane, for uh, a walk down memory lane with the Trail Breakers.
Okay. That's good.